Support for this program comes from viewers like you. Thank you. Pour yourself a cold one and get comfy. Another half hour of Hatterberg's People is coming your way. You've heard of this lake, maybe even been there, but do you know its interesting history? Larry uncovers some of the surprising details and talks with this woman who worked to preserve that history for future generations. Meanwhile, three generations of a Wichita family made their own history. Discover what put them in the record book and how they got the old-fashioned art of horseshoeing back in the news. Also, learn how a small town movie theater came back to life decades after shutting down. It all started with a community-minded man who had a plan. And as Wichita's old town area was becoming hip, it caught the attention of this itinerant artist who liked it so much he decided to stay for a while. Learn about the legacy he left behind. Hi everybody, I'm Larry Hedeberg. And I'm Susan Peters. Those are just a few of Larry's classic stories that are dusted off, queued up, ready to roll. Another edition of Hatterberg's People starts right now. These stories are like old friends. Their lives radiate from the screen like prophets of the past. They were teachers, but not in a classroom. Instead, they taught about life to those around them who cared to listen, and I was their student. History that could have been lost forever is saved, and efforts that would have gone unrecognized are now etched in stone. Marion County Lake is one of Central Kansas's charming little gems, a quaint little tucked away locale that provides great recreation and beauty. But the lake also comes with an interesting backstory, and that was going unnoticed until a woman named Helen Beckham started investigating. It's a good place to be. It is a blessing that we um, have it here in Marion County. In one of the lake homes that dot the landscape, Helen Beckham is responsible for keeping much of this lake history alive. When I found out that it was built by the CCC, and then when I found out that it was built by black veterans, I mean, that even made it more interesting. I just think that, that the history that was happening at that time made people just a little bit more great. Designed by Marion County engineer James Meisner, it was black veterans who worked on the project, a project that has captured Helen's life. I just think that it's very important that anything that has been made for future generations is our responsibility to make sure that the future generation gets to enjoy it. Helen is responsible for having the site and its many structures placed on the National Register of Historic Places. And to pay respect to these men, we need to save the structures they built. Without that, it's possible many of these buildings built by those black veterans might be gone and no one would remember. That won't happen. I want to invite people to come to this area because it is very, very unique. See, look at this wall here with those two triangles. Yeah. A neighbor, 13-year-old Landon Leaker, also became involved in the project. One day he took a walk with Helen and his sense of history was piqued. I don't think it's that uncommon to have somebody my age to do this, but I just wanted to find and restore this lake to its original form. Now, with a statue dedicated to those who built the lake and a continuing interest by a new generation. There, everything's different around this lake. Helen Beckham's crusade to keep lake history alive is a success. I just felt like a god would look at me and say, hey, you didn't get much done. But you have. I have. 
Now, in the years after that 2006 story, Helen also helped create a small lake museum at the park. Her work there will keep the rich history of the area alive for generations to come. Unfortunately, Helen passed away in 2014, just shy of her 82nd birthday. It's so nice when people take the time to restore history and make the rest of us aware of what's just right around us. You know? I love history. and. She passed away when she mm -hmm. was almost 82, mm -hmm. but yet she still lives on through what she left for us. And she'll live on forever right mm -hmm. here in Kansas. Uh, most people probably have no clue what a farrier does. Well, back in the old days, a blacksmith and farrier were common terms used to describe those who took care of the horse's hooves by shoeing and trimming. Of course, there aren't many of those jobs around anymore, and that's why a few years ago, Three generations of a Wichita family made the news. Uh, a lot of these people out here are just, they're tremendous people. I mean, uh, we have clients that would do anything for you. I think she just needs to be stood up more. That's Sean McDonough over there working with a local vet and some horse owners and trainers. They're flexing really good. Not I mean, too bad. Yeah. Sean is a farrier, but he isn't the only one in the family. That's his dad, Pat McDonough, back in the 70s, who was the first. Well, he's now retired. But this is Sean's son, Timothy, the third generation to continue this old tradition. And he's picking it up quick. I mean, um, we're really happy with, with how he's doing with them. The family is the only living three generations of farriers in the U.S. That's certified by the Brotherhood of Working Farriers Association. We have a lot of fun. I mean, you get a hang out with your kids and it's, it's, a, it's a job where you can go to work and take your kids with you, you know, and uh, even when they're adults. Oh, yeah. yeah. I watched my dad do it for a long time. I sat, I basically just sat on the fence watching him. I thought that was pretty cool. And then when I graduated high school, I went to college and I decided I didn't like it. So I called dad up and told him I wanted to do it. This right here is the most dangerous part of doing this. If the horse jerks his foot away and the nail is sticking out and it gets hung up in your apron, you oh no, like that, you're usually in, bad, in a bad way. As Sean works, the tools of the trade shine in the morning sun as it slowly warms oh the no. barn. Tools like these have been used for centuries to mold, shape, and create new shoes for the horses. For instance, this one is a barrel horse. If the shoes don't fit proper, if they fit ill, she goes around the barrel and hits one of them, and the horse falls, and it can cause a catastrophic accident. Okay, well, we, uh, we've seen a demonstration of exactly how... Back in 1994, before Sean's dad, Pat, retired, he and Sean appeared on the cake TV show Old Mike and Mogi. Now, Sean and his dad were and are one of only two pairs of master farriers certified in the U.S. We like to help people help their horse, and they're, they're appreciative of it too, you know. And the next generation continues the old tradition. And that, that's, a, that's a great thing to me. I mean, I, I just, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Well, since that story in 2011, Grandfather Patrick has passed away, but Sean and his son Timothy are still practicing that time-honored profession. And they don't have a lot of competition because there's not a lot of people wanting to be a farrier. Exactly, so. exactly. But how cool that they still do that. Yeah, good for them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, along with fewer horses and farriers, there are fewer movie theaters these days. Decades ago, they started closing down in a lot of small towns. Yeah, the same thing happened in Pretty Prairie. But then along came Daryl Albright. This story is from 1994. Hi, Ben, how are you? And Starburst. Howdy, Jay. Okay, that'd be a dollar. There you go. The smell of popcorn hangs in the air like old movies cling to the mind. It's nearly showtime in Pretty Prairie, Kansas. Pretty Prairie, the name says it all. This is the heartland. Some say the real America, or at least a remnant of the past. What you need today? Pound sliver, okay. The grocery store is not an easy way to make a living, in a small town in particular. But uh, as long as we can flog the dead horse, we'll do it. That's Daryl Albright. He's the local grocer. See, if you're just a little bit taller, you'd be able to sit in the chair, wouldn't you? Daryl is also the man behind the revival of the town's old civic movie theater. This theater was opened in uh, 
June of 1936. It closed in the 50s. In 1981, Darrell opened it again, one night a week for eight weeks, every spring. When the old yellow curtain with long forgotten ads finally goes up, time stops and celluloid friends who never age return. It's a lot of fun. It's just there's something special about this place that has sat here so long, so empty and so quiet uh, to bring life back to it and to have people come and enjoy. It's fun to, to introduce the new generations to the old movies. You can bring your kids here or your date and not be embarrassed. In this aging, hot, and claustrophobic projection booth, Daryl Albright is himself rejuvenated. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. A kid in the candy store, except this is acceptable. <laughs> Some of our vices get us in trouble. This one's OK. And townsfolks like it, too. Once a week in the spring, memories and audiences return like the flowers. Now we have a special interest in our gang because the kid that played alfalfa, Carl Schweitzer, lived in Pretty Prairie. This is the end. I'd rather sleep with a bunch of porcupines. Alfalfa's gone from Pretty Prairie, and so are many of the people who originally saw the old films. But in a small town, having your own theater means you don't have to go to the big city. If we don't provide entertainment for ourselves, and if we don't keep our towns alive, no one from Wichita or Hutchinson or Kingman is going to do that for us. We have to do it ourselves. At the Pretty Prairie Civic Theater, there are only a few more weeks left in this year's season. I think anything that is quality is good no matter how old it is. Given up for dead, the Civic Theater lives again in Pretty Prairie and will forever in the minds of folks like Daryl Albright. We go home happy. Now that little theater kept people entertained for another 19 years. Then in 2013, Mother Nature blew the lid off the joint when a storm destroyed the roof and that destroyed everything mm. inside as well. It looked like curtains for the old theater, but then a roofing company teamed up with the city and some volunteers and they repaired the building. Only in a small town here. That Isn't pretty it? prairie school district took it over in 2018, and now students operate the theater. It's an opportunity for them to get a hands-on business and career training. What an incredible story and a follow-up story. It, yeah, Daryl Albright, the guy who started this, just loved the old theater, and it's so nice to see that another generation is now taking it over and doing so well, particularly with the young people, giving them a chance to learn to trade. Great. I want to take a drive, little drive out to Pretty Prairie and go to that theater. I bet it's yeah. neat inside. It, it, it's a pretty town, Pretty Prairie. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> I know it is. Uh, it's an ongoing challenge across Kansas, keeping small towns alive. Yeah, to people just passing through the unincorporated community of St. Joe, may seem like just another little tiny spot along the road. Uh, but to Pat and Jolene Gerard, it is home, and they are a big part of keeping the town going. When a car comes over the hill in downtown St. Joseph, Kansas, it's almost out of town. Everybody just kind of takes care of each other around here, and, and that's just nice. Nearby, irrigation rigs stand in for rain clouds. Country roads separate the soybeans from the corn, and at the figurative intersection of rural and yesterday, a little building stands tall, linking today with history. Just kind of snowballed and here we are. The St. Joe's store has been on this corner since 1888. For years, it was empty. Businesses came and went. Well, the Gerards documented its condition through these pictures. Then, through the rubble of the past, Jolene and her husband, Pat, decided to restore the old place, first as an office for him, and then the idea came to make it a community gathering spot. It exceeded our expectations. As Jolene cooks up old-fashioned mouth-watering chicken on a lunch that's prepared on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, there's one other thing you should know about the town. It's a heart and soul. I mean, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's the jewel of St. Joe. 
The church at St. Joseph stands as a historical monument to the early French population who began the town and built the church. The Catholic diocese decided they could no longer support it, so several couples, including Jolene and Pat, stepped forward to create a foundation to keep the church open. It was the reason why the store, we started the store. The, no church, no store. Everybody would end up down at the store after mass or whether it was a Saturday night or Sunday morning and uh, the two kind of went together. There you go. Let me help you out. There are days when I have to remind Pat that we're having fun and kind of vice versa, but it, it is a lot of fun and the people are what make it fun. Pat, he's, uh, he's a good cook and Jolene's a better cook. Everybody's got a talent. His abuse, giving abuse is his talent. With home-cooked meals simmering on the stove and the Gerard's daughters providing the wait staff, folks do enjoy their food. Chicken, this day. Now the store isn't open in the evenings, oh, okay. but many times friends and customers ask to borrow the key so they can have a little private get-together. Keep track of what they eat or drink and find a pile of money on the bar the next day and they keep track of what they, they've used and sometimes we come out money ahead actually, so that's what's nice about it. The Girards aren't here to make a lot of money. This little store is simply about keeping that sense of community, community between the church, the store, and the town. History here is still being made. It didn't seem complete without the store being open also. You just know you can depend on people here. That was 2011. Now things are a little different. Pat and Jolene sold the store in 2018. And as of spring 2019, new owner Marty Holtz is in the process of doing a complete renovation. Now he plans to reopen the store as a full service restaurant featuring seafood and fresh roasted coffee. Sounds good already, mm -hmm. doesn't it? Well, you can follow the progress on the St. Joe Store Facebook page. What a neat deal happening in a small town. I ate at that restaurant, delicious. I'd go back every day. If yeah, I yeah, and it's where the, <laughs> the townspeople gather. Absolutely. Gives you them gotta a place have, to go. You gotta have a restaurant like mm -hmm. that. From the tiniest of Kansas towns to the biggest, Wichita's Old Town District used to be a bombed out old industrial area it was an embarrassing eyesore. Yeah, then in the 1990s, it was reborn as an entertainment and cultural center for the city. Well, that attracted all sorts of interesting and talented people, such as Grover Beeman. Everybody talks about a North Light window. I got a 12-foot North Light window. Now, that's just pretty hard to beat. You ask a guy, how he got into fertilizer business, and he said because there was money in it. I've never heard an artist ever say I got into art because I heard there was big money. It's one of my favorite pictures I've ever done, actually. It seemed to work. In the heart of Old Town and in the middle of his life, artist Grover Beeman has come home. I mean, it's a good atmosphere, great atmosphere. I like to see this stuff. Thank God I'm still left over from the 60s. I kind of went around a lot of places, but without return tickets. So it took me 37 years to get back here. I draw from imagination, pure imagination. Then Old Town itself, you know, is kind of like the heart of hearts. Well, of course, the oldness. There's some great lines and textures and just all kind of stuff in here. It reminded me of a little bit of New Orleans, a little bit of San Francisco, and you know, it's like where East meets West. Well, I'm gonna do some interior sketches in here, you know, some pen and ink drawings. A little bit exotic here and there, and at the same time, a little touch of Kansas. And each one of those places, Places up through there has a another view. It's a great, great way to isolate distance. I'd like to have a a lady companion that would sit around and drew with me, you know, because it gets lonely because you're, you know, you're living in your head all the time. I just put that one up yesterday. Mm -hmm. 
It's good. You know, it's really good. Now, even though he was a Wichita native, Grover was a free spirit who didn't like to be tied down. He also lived in the Virgin Islands, California, New Mexico. <laughs> His last stop was McAllen, Texas, where he died in 2014 at age of 71. I would follow him around and he would have this sketching pad and he would do all sorts of sketches of the different things in Old Town. And he was a free spirit, uh, you know, Isn't he just, he just wanted to do his thing and be left alone. Yeah, and isn't that neat? He came back to Kansas and blessed us all with his talent. He did. He could have stayed away forever. That's right. You know? He drew a picture of my wife. He did not. And gave it to her, and we have it up in our kitchen. It's you a wonderful too. picture. Oh, I can't wait to see it sometime. Oh, I'll have you come over. Oh. Well, you know, some artists create with paint and canvas. Others use clay and a potter's wheel. But Lowell Tassett of Fort Dodge used fire and steel. Yeah, the same way the old blacksmiths made horseshoes, Lowell made beautiful and inspiring sculptures. This is so much fun, it's so challenging sometimes, but the creativity end of it is just really fun. Since 1864, Fort Dodge in western Kansas has been at history's doorstep. And in this old building, Lowell Tassett's blacksmith shop continues a western tradition. But instead of shoeing horses, he produces art of steel. Nature is so unique, trying to copy things from nature is the fun part of this really. Most of the time you have to disassemble a flyer just to see how it's put together in order to try to duplicate it. There is a heat to his art. <laughs> it's cooling off fast. It's a place he can hammer his frustrations into oblivion. You can take your frustrations out on a piece of metal pretty easily. On the walls of his shop hang cold steel memories of long ago farms. Ancient steel that becomes the recycled art of the future. Yes, for me it's treasure. Take this old steel file. With it, Lowell sees snakes. Well, I see snake scales here. This, I see his head right here and his tongue and fangs and this I see his tail. What I visualized in my head usually comes out in the final product. I'm not a die-hard conservationist or environmentalist, but I think it's important for us to conserve what we have. That's why you see all these old farm equipment pieces around here, because I reuse those. And from the forge comes this art. Unbreakable steel saints shrouded in mystery, yet with a cold beauty hammered from hot steel. The artistic part of it is what draw, drawed me to blacksmithing. Now in his Fort Dodge blacksmith shop, what was once left in a field to rust becomes one of nature's wonders by a man who keeps the old days alive by creating cold beauty from iron and steel. There are other things I would like to do. I like to fish and things, but this is, this is still more fun. Well, in his final years, Lowell turned his focus to liturgical art for churches. You can see some of it at the church where he worshiped, Our Lady of Guadalupe Cathedral in Dodge City. And then in 2008, Lowell went to meet his maker. He was 70 years old. But he left back behind this wonderful art that will, for generations, inspire people. Live on. That's right. Uh, this next story is about a couple small town guys with big time dreams. Now one was a country western singer, the other a Hollywood filmmaker. Now they teamed up and returned to their hometown of Oxford to do something big that got just about everybody in the town into the act. Dave! More than, than me being somebody, I hope these videos help show that Oxford is somebody. If we have this set up, then we can go straight from there to this. It is the kind of homecoming that usually doesn't happen in Oxford, Kansas. My hometown. What a better setting than uh, Oxford, Kansas. We closed down Main Street of Oxford, which is great. A Hollywood director and a country western singer, both from the same Kansas town, and both hoping to make a mark in and their professional careers. Action. Oh, 
State Parks is trying to live his American dream. He makes his home in Nashville, but began his singing career in Oxford and is on the cusp of making it in the big time. We like to think of ourselves as big time, but we're really not big time yet. But we're, we're getting there. Here we go. And action. Rolling. <laughs> That's it, cut. Dallas Henry, an actor, now directing the Dave Parks music video. He makes his home in LA, but remembers his Oxford roots. It's great, I mean, it's great to see all these fresh faces and, and all these people I haven't seen in years, and it's, it's wonderful. Rolling. And action. The town is the set for the two videos that are being shot. The local grain elevator, a great place to get that Kansas piece. Turn it off. Cut. That's fine. No, that's fine. That's perfect. Cut. No, but you just stand there is all you need to do. And, and don't look at the camera when it comes around. Where do you want to start from? You want to start, you want to Down. reveal him like this. Yes, exactly. Okay. There, yeah, that's it, Dave. There we go. Sometimes it's a struggle just to pay the rent. My checkbook ain't broke, but I can tell it's been had to borrow. Quick, 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 quick. Cut. Good job. First one's in, guys. It's always the hardest. All right. This is gonna be something we'll remember the rest of our lives. Well, Dave Parks tells us that was a very special time in his life. And here's a look at the finished product. It's a very catchy song, and it's an entertaining video. Now, Dave never went on to win a Grammy, but he still does music while running his own software company and teaching technology at a Nashville area high school. Meanwhile, Dallas Henry works for a video production company in Cleveland, Ohio, and from what we understand, they're still very good friends. Yeah, they basically took over the town of Oxford. They had shooting locations everywhere, a big crane camera, Many. and it was great fun. I think the town really enjoyed it. And they kept their friendship over they all these years. They kept their friendship. That's the important thing. That's right, and they have that little video yeah. that they can show their grandkids. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. If you have a question or a comment, please send us an email. Hatterberg's people at kpts.org is the address. Until next time, I'm Susan Peters. Thanks for watching. And I'm Larry Hatterberg. We hope to see you back here next week. See you later.